It's good to see you this morning. I hope you'll take your copy of God's Word. And if you don't have a copy, just write where you're seated. If you reach underneath there, you'll find some books. There's a copy of God's Word there for you, and you're welcome. If you don't have a copy, to take that home with you to make sure that you're able to follow along in God's Word this morning. Exodus is where we are today. We have stepped out of the book of Genesis. We are now um, focused on this... um, third era of biblical history. In Genesis, we discovered the creation era in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and then in Genesis 12 through 50, we concluded um, the patriarchal era era of history, of biblical history. And now we're going to step into the third era. If you're following along in the 30 days to understanding, you know these 12 eras are delineated for you so that you can better grasp and to hang your thoughts on this framework of what is going on in the Bible. What is going on in the Bible, by the way? What's going on? It's a basic question that not only do we have, but it's a question that even our children will have. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service, what are you going to tell them? What are you going to tell them? When that sense of holy curiosity settles in and they ask you, mom, dad, pops, honey, whatever your grandpa. Paul grandma name is what does this all mean what's transpiring here what's the significance of all these things that we do and that you do here in church these are basic questions questions that children need to have um, answers to because if not what happens is is that those of us who've experienced in this generation a fresh and new what God has done for us if we do not communicate it to the next generation it will be soon forgotten and those who understand what God has done for us we must understand the relevance of passing that down to the next generations and so the story of God continues to unfold itself in the book of Exodus And then we're going to move very quickly, one message from the book of Exodus, one message from the book of Leviticus. We'll move very quickly as you're reading through the scripture. Know that we'll soon catch up with you and we'll we'll, we'll step beyond where you are. And so I'll begin teaching and preaching uh, in chapters that you have not quite arrived to. But to this point, you've read read Exodus chapter 12. Joseph has passed away. He's told his brothers that there will come a time in the history of their people that God would deliver them out of the land. Remember, they've come to Egypt, uh, and they've come to Egypt because of a famine. And there, Joseph, he sees his brothers, his heart's broken for them. They think ultimately he's going to punish them because they are the ones who sold him into slavery. But he says to them in that classic statement in Genesis chapter 15, that what you intended for evil, God intended and he meant for good. And so that God was going ahead of them, as he always does for his children, God in a sovereign way is moving on behalf of his people, and he does. He moves on behalf of his his people, and there Joseph meets him in Egypt, and there is this great provision of God. And so here they are, they begin to abide. These 70 people who've come to Egypt because of a famine are now going to multiply over a 430-year period of time. They will be somewhere between 2 and 3 million people people will be residing in Egypt and the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 1 that something interesting takes place two things actually because he tells them in verse 2 in verse 7 the people of Israel were fruitful and they increased greatly they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them there were Israelites everywhere but then there was a Pharaoh who arose to power in verse 8 who knew not Joseph. Who's Joseph? Who's this man who was successful in interpreting the dream of Pharaoh of old some 430 years earlier? Who is this Joseph? And he forgets who this Joseph is and the significance to Egyptian history. And he, all he can see are all of these Israelites, not 70, but they're into the millions now. And all he can see is all these people and he's threatened by them. He's threatened by them. And so he begins to treat them harshly. He begins to to 
by his treatment of them, he causes great suffering and, and, and conflict within them. And so God raises up, he raises up Moses. And he raises up Moses to be a deliverer, to use him in a mighty way. And one of the things that he does is that he tells Moses he's going to be with him and he's going to speak through him and he's going to use him in a, in a marvelous way. And so he, he raises up Moses in such a way that God is shown himself to be highly exalted among all the gods of the Egyptians. And this is very vital to understanding what's going on because the Lord is confronting uh, the their idea and their notion of gods. They are, they are pantheists. They, they believe God is in creation and creation itself is somehow uh, deified. Uh, they, 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 they worship the creation, but they also worship many, many different gods. And so God is about to show himself as highly exalted, unique, supreme, sufficient, and wholly other than anything that they've ever known. And he's going to demonstrate that through a series of 10 plagues. Ten plagues. We don't have time to delve into all of them, but we're going to come to the tenth plague because it's significant to understanding the Passover in Exodus chapter 12. And he's going to confront their notion of God and their understanding of the power of God. He wants it to be without, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that he's God and that there is no other God and that any attempt to imagine another God is simply that. It is a figment of their imagination. It is something that they have designed and they have created to somehow manage the adversities of life or, or, or the challenges of life. They've created these gods. And so when you read this Exodus account, you see that God is doing a great thing. And so he, after 430 years of slavery, of bondage, God is about to bring his people out of the land. He's about to set them free. And so we look at the, at the setting, the, first of all, the, the bondage of, of, of Israel as they, as they also began to seek after these gods, God is wanting to reestablish their identity. Now he tells them, based on Genesis 12, that he's going to bless them. And he tells them, based on the creation account, that they are to be fruitful and to multiply, and they're doing a lot of that because there's two or three million of them. So they're getting that part down. But he's wanting them to understand that he is bigger than the gods of the Egyptians, that he is greater than. And so through this process, through this journey, God is going to show himself in a mighty way. Now there's a lot of, that's a lot of prelude to what we're really we're going to look at this morning. But the first thing I want to say in light of the setting is the bondage of Israel, the blunder of the Egyptians, the Pharaoh who thinks that, that by, with every attempt of God to try to arrest his attention, one of the things you might want to note is how Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart, we are told. Several times, he has hardened his heart. By his own initiative, he resists God. Now, at first, he seems to be receptive through each of the plagues that, begins, that God begins to confront the false deities in the Egyptians' lives. He, he, he hardens his heart, and, and then he seems to re repent. But then at some point, he turns his heart in such a way that he's hardening his heart. And the Bible says God hardened his heart. Now, some people say, well, see what God did? No, he hardened his heart first, and then God took the evil intentions of Pharaoh's heart, and he bent them toward good. He used them. While Pharaoh intended them for evil, God used them for good, and only God can do that. And you need to keep that in mind, because all things, as we talked about last week, are working together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purposes, Romans 8, 28. Now, you can't say that if you're not a child of God. If you're a child of God, you can say, listen, whatever comes into my life, it must bow before him before it enters into my life. It must bow before the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ before it has any impact upon my life. God is not somehow um, aloof and he's not out there and ready to be informed about the things that, we're going, that are going on in our life. He knows about the things that are happening and that will happen in our lives prior to them occurring in our lives. And it's a good thing somebody does, right? And that somebody, that somebody is the Lord God who is capable of taking those and using them for good. And so the Lord wants to take you out or wants to bring you uh, through a journey of bondage. He, he wants to take you on a journey out of bondage, excuse me. He wants to bring you out of. The story of the Exodus is simply that God, in all of his greatness, is wanting to bring his people out of 
and into what he always designed for them, what he always had purposed for them, but to a large extent that they rejected and that they, they opposed. And so these plagues come down as God's judgment upon the Egyptians. It's a way of establishing his superiority. Here we're talking about Egypt, which is the, it is the dominant world power of the day, you understand. Economically, militarily, politically, there is no greater empire in the world, and it is about to be humbled, broken, as any empire will when it stands and shakes its fist at Almighty God. Any, any, including this country. There is one Lord, there is one God, there is one King. His name is Jesus, okay? So let's get this straight. Lest we think so great. I'm, listen, I'm not ashamed to be in America. Don't, don't get me wrong here. I just want to make the point is that every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Every nation represented before the king, we will bow our knee before the king. Every nation, including the great Egyptian empire. And he humbles them. And he does so in this incredible way so that it's clear without a doubt. Well, I better get to the passage of Scripture, right? There's so much in here. So they, they, the Lord, in, in chapter 11, verse 10, look at that. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. So at this point, he, he's resistant. Verse 1 of chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. That's significant. I'm going to reestablish your calendar. You're going to, this is going to be a defining moment in your life that you and every generation after you will mark as the historic moment in which I showed myself in great redemption so that you will think in terms of your history and your future in terms of what I did in your life. You will mark your calendar based upon the most significant spiritual event that has ever happened in your life. Your calendar will bow at my knee. That's what he's telling them. Now, he's changing the calendar. This is not the pagan calendar. The pagan calendar and the Egyptian calendar, they operate on a whole, new, a whole other system. We don't have time to get into it. But it was on a whole and completely different system. But he's saying to them, what I'm going to do in your midst is going to redefine how you see your calendar. It's going to redefine how you look at your calendar. Is there not a Christian application somewhere in there? Do I have to spell it out? I don't think so. I think you're getting the point. I'm getting the point. Why, that jumped all over me early this morning, by the way. So this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall... Take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Look at the qualifications of the lamb. It shall be without blemish. A male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you will keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So he's giving them specifics. In this last plague, it is essential, it's critical that you follow the directions. These symbols are important. They speak to a reality that existed then, but were a foreshadowing ultimately of what Christ would be for us. He's describing how they're going to sacrifice the lamb. And who was it in John's gospel, who when Jesus began to walk up said, Behold, the lamb of God, which what? That's right. Boy, you guys have been reading your Bible. I, don't, I can't get anything past you. It's a good thing. These symbols. Take a lamb without blemish. Do so in this newly defined month for you. 
in this newly defined day, for it will forever represent your day and your time of deliverance. This lamb that you're going to take, it needs to be without blemish. It doesn't need, don't bring your lamed animals up here. Don't, don't bring an animal that you think, well, it's just about to die anyway. It's not going to serve any purpose. Let's go ahead and sacrifice it. God said, no, no, no. I'm not going to accept anything that you bring to me as a leftover. You know, this is not the garage sale for God, okay? You know what I'm saying? Don't bring your stuff up here. Pedal it around to God and say, God's going to be happy with it. God doesn't want your garage sale stuff. You with me on that? Don't bring your seconds and your thirds and your whatever else. Make sure that this lamb that you're going to bring into your household, by the way, and you're not going to sacrifice until the 14th, you're going to bring that lamb in. Now, listen, if you've got children in your home, have you seen anything any cuter than a little lamb? So you're going to bring this lamb into your home. You're going to hold it in your home. You're, You're going to cherish this lamb. Now, you know what happens when we get animals that close to us? We give them names, right? My father-in-law, he used to, you know, used to have a bunch of cattle, and he named those things. You know, he never would, he never would, would butcher the cows that he had. He would go and sell them, and he'd buy one he didn't know, and he would butcher it, and that's what we would eat. <laughs> he, could, he couldn't do it, right? He wouldn't do it. I didn't know that at first because we like, you know, getting, I thought, are you kidding me, Glenn? I know your cattle's good. We don't know about the rest of them, that beef, you know? Well, he just couldn't do it. He couldn't bring himself to it. But you see what the Lord's doing. You're going to bring this lamb into your house so it's going to be close to you, and then you're going to sacrifice it? What is it about this lamb that we must cherish and also mourn? What is it about this land that we must cherish and we must also mourn? That is the lamb, isn't it? That we cherish him and that we worship him because all that this lamb was to them was a prefiguring, a foreshadowing. It was design, by design was there to point them ultimately to the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world in John's gospel. To be cherished and to be mourned. And every little child certainly would have seen their lamb that was slain. It seems, it seems like, wow, this, this seems a little cruel, right? It, it seems like, well, they're not very sensitive to these children. But these children have already been living, you know, as far as they know, the only thing they've ever known in their life is slavery. The only thing they've ever known is, is being mistreated. The only thing they've ever known is the injustices of what, what a government and what a people and what a tyrant is willing to heap upon someone. That's the only thing they've ever known. And so this is God, God being very specific. These symbols take a lamb without blemish. It pictures what Christ would be for us as a sinless lamb without blemish, critical in terms of our understanding. Was it not those, those leaders, Pilate and Herod, who could find no fault in who? In the lamb. There was nothing. They could find no fault with him. His sinlessness is evident in the New Testament and certainly is linked to this event in the Old Testament. And, and so these instructions, they were to take the lamb and then they were to take the blood, verse 7, Take some of the blood and put it on the doorpost in the lintel of the houses in which they eat. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. And anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now what is he telling them? Now he's getting them ready. He's saying when this happens, you're going to take the lamb, you're going to make the sacrifice, you're going to take its blood. Very important that the blood is applied. Not just simply that there's a killing that has taken place. Not simply that the life of the lamb has been lost, has been taken. That's what's happened, right? It's not enough that, that the blood had to be applied. And it had to be applied over the doorpost so that, so that when the destroyer would come, when the destroyer would come in the night, that their firstborn would be spared. 
That's, that's the point of it. That, that God in his judgment would spare them. He would be merciful toward them and he would, he would spare them. And so the blood had to be applied. And they had to take the sacrifice and make the sacrifice and to cook the sacrifice and to eat it. There was just enough. They would sacrifice based upon what they needed. And, and if the household wasn't large enough, as we read, they would meet with an assembly next to them, a household next to them. This was to be done in a way so that the whole community, the whole family was participating. This wasn't like one person doing this. This was the whole community. There's something to be said about the community a faith gathering together like we're doing right here today. We are gathering together to commemorate and to think and to consider what Christ has done for us as they were called to commemorate what God was doing in their midst. And so the blood had to be applied. They ate the unleavened bread. The idea here is that because things were going to happen quickly, when this all transpired, they were to be ready. They were to be postured in such a way, not lounging, you know, near their, uh, near their table or laying near their table and, and, and taking a meal together. No, they were ready as soon as they ate their meal, their staff in hand, their sandals on their feet, their, their, their robe upon them, that when the time was ready, they were, they were ready to go. When God set them free, they were ready to walk through that door to leave bondage and enter into freedom. Are you ready? What are you waiting for, by the way? Christ already died for you. He died for me. He paid the price. He died on the cross. Who, what is it that you're waiting for? This is your moment. This is your time. God in grace, in goodness, is, has sent his son to die upon the cross for our sins to be that lamb whose blood was sacrificed and the blood now applied for us it's applied but we have to we have to believe it we have to pass through we have to enter into what God wants for us the unleavened bread they didn't have time to let their bread rise no time to allow leaven to allow. I mean, this is, the idea is that this was going to be happening quickly. You getting the sense of this if you've read it? And the bitter herbs that they were to eat were to be a reminder. And when they ate those herbs, it would be a reminder of the sorrow, the sense of repentance for all that they had done. That mourning and that repentance for all of these years that we have remained in this state of bondage. We repent of it. We repent. It, it wasn't just that the Egyptians had, had enslaved them. It's that their eyes had ceased to focus on the one true and living God. And they, as a people, had become so um, identified with the Egyptian culture that they were living in that they had become a threat. I mean, 430 years have transpired. I'm sure early on it wasn't so much a big deal, right? But over time, it's sort of like, who, who are these people? And they're what? They're prospering? And they're doing well, and, and they're like us, but they're not like us. They seem to be getting ahead. We're not. And they become a threat, and, and the speculation goes on, and this anti-Semitic kind of mentality begins to set in against God's people. Do you see some of that happening today, by the way? There's a rise. There's a disregard for Jewish people today, you're seeing a rise of that. How could we, in the face of history, and I, I know this is a little bit of a, this rabbit will hunt, okay, but I don't have time to hunt it very long. But there, there, is a, there is a, how can we, in the face of history, I've been watching a series of documentaries on World War II, how can we, in the face of history, deny people their sense of identity? But we are so sophisticated and smart, aren't we? We just have arrived. And the arrogance and the kind of, well, the bottom line is this, is that all of us were created in the image of God, Genesis tells us. So respect for other human beings is fundamental to what we believe as Christians. Even if we disagree with them, by the way, we can still regard them as someone created in the image of God. Now, they might not be reflecting it all the, all the time, but they were created in the image of God. That goes for all people, by the way. But to be anti-Semitic and to reject God's people is exactly where the Egyptians found themselves. 
And so God's people were, had become a part of the culture. And, and they had begin, begun to worship some of these other gods that were figments of their imagination and abandoned their worship of the one true and living God. And so here they were instructed to stand, make the sacrifice, be ready to go when God set them free to, to, to go ahead and, and, and to be on the march. And out of this journey, God delivers them. And so they're told to be fully clothed, but some, something else has taken place here because he says in, in, verse, in verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. So you see the scriptures, he's saying, this is a judgment on all of their gods, okay? Their pantheistic idea of gods, their polytheistic ab about gods, the many gods, the God in creation, we're there, we're there in culture today. You know, we worship the creation as opposed to the creator. Romans 1 says a lot about a culture. When you stop worshiping God, and what will happen is we, by by nature, we are people who worship. We will worship something. We just do. And, and it can be anything, by the way. I mean, it, it can be as, as, as silly as just a stick that's standing up somewhere. I mean, you, you just all you need is a megaphone and stand on the corner, holler a few times, somebody's going to show up and believe you. That, that's just how it is. It's the United States of America. Somebody's going to show up <laughs> and believe the nonsense that you're espousing because that's all it would be. And so this is, this is against the gods. Uh, the gods of that culture. And he says in, in the last part of verse 12, for I am the Lord. This is a defining statement. I am the Lord. I'm going to recalibrate who you are. I'm gonna redefine, I'm gonna redeem who you are. And I'm going to reorientate your life to my calendar, to my way of thinking, to to a way of life that's going to radically change who you are and distinguish you in the cultures in which you will live going forward. I want my people to be distinguishable from the culture in which they live. So God is radically changing who they are. This is what he's doing. Now the blood, verse 13, the blood, excuse me, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. You say, what well, it just, I know, you know, if you're reading for the, the Bible for the first time, you're looking at it and saying, man, he's just gonna take out the, all of their, their firstborn children? Of the, you know, it, those people who are rejected the belief of God and rejected the sacrifice, rejected the application of the blood apply, he's gonna take them all out? Well, God is gonna bring judgment on those who deserve judgment. If he didn't, he would not be just. Well, why is he doing this? Okay, because look, go to chapter four. Go to chapter four for just a moment in verse 22. Come on, let me hear those pages move. I just want you to see this. For, chapter four. And, and this is very interesting, by the way, because notice how God regards Israel. Chapter 4, verse 22. Then you will say to Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. What he's saying is this, you've been taking my firstborn Israel and for hundreds of years you've been treating them and you've been, you, you, have, you have tried to destroy my firstborn. You have fomented all of your indignation, all of your injustices, all the things that you have done, again, all of your atrocities in the name of what? Your gods in the name of Egyptian superiority in the name of whatever, you decided that you would take my firstborn. And God in his justice says, I will take your firstborn. Now why would this be important? Not only because they had been a threat to, the, to God's firstborn, because isn't this what God's doing? He said way back in Genesis, he, he was going to raise up a seed, a people, a name, a descendant that eventually in time over history would bring forth the Messiah. You see what, you see what Satan's after? He's, he's trying 
to intercept God's plan, but he's, he's formidable, but he's not all-knowing, okay? So let's not give him too much credit, but neither should we walk around and act like he doesn't know what's going on. He does very much knew what was going on, and his plan was to ultimately undermine God's plan of salvation to redeem humanity. That's ultimately what... what what God was doing was to redeem us, and Satan was trying to, he was trying to intervene in that. And, and so God's not through with them. He's going to use this people, his people, that he said he's going to bring forth this, this promise. And he's going to do so in such a way that's, that, is, that is utterly uh, con- convincing. And this is going to, verse 14, this is going to be a memorial for you. And you shall keep it for a feast of the Lord throughout your generations, a statute forever, and you shall keep it as a feast. And so he describes not only the feast of the Passover, but he'll go on to describe, we don't have time to get into the feast of unleavened bread, but the idea is the cleansing of the house. Make sure that there's no leaven found in in the house. Make sure there's no traces of sin. Let there be repentance and brokenness and, and acknowledgement of sin in your life. He said, I'm going to pass over them, but I'm going to take your firstborn. And God, in justice, in justice, a just God, brings forth judgment. Why else would he bring forth the death of Pharaoh's firstborn? Because the Pharaohs were considered to be deities. What he's confronting is this notion that you, as a Pharaoh, Pharaoh's son would be considered the next in line. He would be someone who would be worshipped. And what he's trying to prove to them and show them is that there is, what does he say? I am the Lord. Don't march yourself around here as a human being and think that you are God. Because if you do, this is the kind of conduct that you'll live. You'll build everything around you. Everything will center around you. You'll build the world around you. You'll build your calendar around you. You'll build everything around you. Everyone will, you'll want everyone to acknowledge you as God. And let's make it clear, you're not. And so God, with justice, exercises judgment upon these who had abused his firstborn. Israel. Now, the Passover lamb was designed to bring rescue. The the Passover lamb offered correctly was designed to bring uh, not only a sense of redemption, but was to be something as as a matter of repetition, was to be something they were going to do from here, from, from that day forward, every year to this day, somewhere March and April, depending on when the how the calendar follows, falls every year. Jewish people around the world will observe Passover. They'll do that. And so it's not just a matter of of redemption, but it's a matter of repetition. It's a matter of God instituting something that would be commemorated forever. This is what Jesus was doing, wasn't he? When he was with his disciples the, the, the night in which he was betrayed, what was he doing? We call it the Lord's Supper, but it's the Passover. Jesus was with his disciples and they were, they were observing Passover together. And in the Passover, we see that transition to what we do call the Lord's Supper, where he, where he bows before them. He, he, he communicates to them that as he washes their feet, he bows before them, he cleans, cleanses their feet. And that night, of course, you know, they sell Jesus out and they deny Jesus and everything else. But, but that's the night that Jesus is actually with them. He's taking the Passover with them. And so something that was to be repeated over and over again a rehearsal of, so, of sorts, right? A drama of sorts. So that to this very day, families, Jewish families, will gather themselves together. They'll go through this ritual that exists here so that they can remember and commemorate. We remember what the Lord did. So in every generation, little children rise up, and those children rise up, and what do they do? They say, why are we doing this? Why would we do this all the time? You know, they're children. They're not angels. Okay, did you find that one out? 
So like, it, it sort of works itself out like this. Do we have to go? Well, yeah, son. You, you, yeah, you're going. If you're, yeah, I'm going to beat you if you don't go. No, not the best parenting. Not the best parenting style. This is, do we have to go with an attitude? Doesn't mean you throw an attitude back at them. You say, you know, son, we go to worship the Lord because he died for us. We go to celebrate his name because there's no one like him. We worship the Lord with these other people in the community of faith, our family, our church. We do that because there's nobody like him. We go and we worship him because he shows up and he's not a figment of our imagination. We go and we worship him because when everything is falling apart in our life, we have the great physician who's able to take care of us. We go and we worship the Lord because he has forgiven us. And you can come up with a thousand more reasons positively to tell your children other than just saying, if you don't get those shoes on, I'm gonna use them on you. <laughs> I think I heard someone say that one time. <laughs> you know how it is, mom and dad. I mean, it is royal, battle royale, right? Then you hit this church parking lot, and it's just like little angels come walking out of there. Well, it's not really, but you, you, the parents got a little angel face going on. The kids are still, you know, carrying the attitude a little bit. What I'm saying is, mom and dad, if you don't properly motivate your children to follow the Lord and you don't tell the story, who's going to tell it? There are people in this room, in this place of worship, that didn't have a mom and dad to tell them the story. Who didn't tell them the story? They're here. And they broke the cycle. And you've carried it forward to your children. One of the greatest tests that we'll ever face as parents is not in the moment in which we're raising the children that God's given us. It's tough being a parent today. You'll measure your parenting best when you see how your children are raising your grandchildren. Then you'll be humble. We all are. Because then we realize, oh, I could have done a better job. I wish I would have done this, you know. But God's grace is there. But I'm telling you, that's a different posture than saying they don't even believe in God anymore. They've abandoned any notion of him because basically for all practical purposes, your home was a home where there was no God. He said, no, I believe in God. You, you're attacking me. Because I'm here. I believe in God. I'm telling you functionally there's no difference between saying you believe in God and living as though there is no God in your home and someone who says there is no God and lives as though there's no God. Functionally, there's no difference, is there? I'm talking about functionally. I'm not, all the theory and all the high thinking ideas about, I'm just talking about just getting right down here where we all live. If you don't tell them, and you don't tell them in a convincing way, listen, it's not like you have to make the story up. It's here, it saved you if you've been saved. If you've been redeemed, it changed you. And what you can relate to them is that their heart has been, you've been changed by the power of the gospel. It changed the course of your life. And this is how it's changed your life so that they see it in your life, mom and dad, and they understand what's going on. So starting at home, go and tell the story. Go and tell the story. Go and tell the story. What is not carefully remembered in our families, in our community, in our church, by the way, not just in our family structure, but in our, in our church family as well, is very easily forgotten. If it's not carefully, what I'm saying to you is that based upon the details, and we have to, we, we, we're gonna conclude this, based upon these details, and you read them, and you see all of these things, and you realize that this grand story, God showed up in a big way, it is, it is, this is a powerful story. And it's convincing if you tell it. Just like it is. Just like it is. Now get this. 
and part of the story. So when you tell your kids and you, and you, and you march, and you march, you tell your kids, I, I, there's, there's 20 more things I'd like to share with you. But, hey, chill out. I'm only going to share one. <laughs> so at the end of the, the, end of the story, get, this, is, this is a great thing. At the end of the story, the Bible says, and they plundered the Egyptians. <laughs> So they walked out. They didn't, they didn't steal from the Egyptians. Those Egyptians were sort of like, take everything we have. Just leave. <laughs> just everything. Just take it. Just, just, just leave. God has set you free, and he'll take care of every need you have after the fact. He, he plundered the Egyptians. I love that word. I tell you, whatever, whatever the devil has intended for evil, whatever he's stolen from you, whatever he's robbed from you, the thief comes forth but to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. We just take back the things that God always wanted for us. Lord, you're gracious to us. We thank you for these these epic stories, not myth, not legend, not things that men made up to satisfy their understanding of God. We, we've got plenty of those stories. But the, these stories that we read, these true stories of how you showed up, even when your people were not deserving and that's how you've done it in our lives. You showed up in our lives and we didn't deserve anything. You are gracious and you are merciful to us. And, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that your death, your sacrifice, your blood applied over our lives is all the covering that we need. So we don't fear death. We don't fear, fear hell. We don't fear the grave. We love you, Lord. We love you. Thank you. Lord, for every ear that is hearing the message today, I pray that you would make this come alive. There's so much in this story that we didn't even look at. But it's a story of redemption. It's a story of um, you reclaiming your people. And so I, I pray today that that story has been clear. If, if I've somehow fouled that up, Lord, forgive me. Because I do pray in these moments that, that those who are hearing will understand there is redemption. You are a God who redeems. That's what you want to do. You want to redeem. If we will trust you, if we will believe, we'll be spared any judgment, any righteous act on your part. We deserve justice. We deserve the judgment. But you're willing to give us redemption, salvation, and so we thank you for that. And I pray that, Lord, each person here would know that truth. In Jesus' name, amen.